Go. Okay. So, Parsha Mishpatim is the Parsha of the Mishpatim of the judgments. It comes right after, let's look back for a minute. We had Yitro, which starting on page 406, 408, 410, 412, we had the Aseret Hadivrot. We had the Ten Commandments. Okay? And then after that, we have Hashem telling Moshe certain additional dinim, certain additional laws. Right? If you look on page 413, okay, verse 19 there. Hashem said to Moshe, Right, Lota Sun Iti Elohe Chesef Elohe Zahav Lota Sulachem. Right, verse twenty. Don't make images of that which is with me, gods of silver, gods of gold. Mizbach Adama, an altar of earth. Taseli, you shall make for me, and you'll bring your sacrifices upon that. And then the very last verse is Lota Aleb Maalot. Al Mizbechi. You shall not ascend to my altar with ma'alot, with steps. Asher lo tigale ervatcha alav. So that your nakedness will not be uncovered upon it. Okay? So instead of there being steps to ascend up to the, ra- up to the altar, there was a Ramp, right? A kevesh. There was a ramp that would that that would go up. Now, from this pasuk, this pasuk is the is the bridge almost between the Sinai experience, the Aseret Hadibrot, and now we get started with. Look on page four seventeen. All right, uh, let's look at English. Let's just look at, at the titles here. The civil law, Jewish bondsmen, sale of a daughter, murder, manslaughter, killing a slave, penalty of bodily injury, death caused by an animal, a pit, an animal damaging property, one who steals livestock, self-defense, payment for theft, damages caused by livestock, laws of showmen, those are our guard, uh, people who are watching property, a borrower, seduction, sens- sens- seduction, Sensitivity to the helpless and abandoned, right? Free loans, integrity of the judicial process, fair dissipation of justice, Sabbath of the land of the week, pilgrimage hol- uh, festivals, right? Uh, what is going on over here? Right, we just went from Mount Sinai, right? And now here we are getting involved in all of this nitty gritty damages you I, I i watched it it was stolen how do i know it was stolen give me back my thing i can't it was stolen swear that it was stolen you stole it i didn't steal it right i my, my ox is going nuts over here it's trampling on stuff it's eating stuff it's goring stuff what are all the damage i gotta pay i mean whoa we would we, we were there we were on mount sinai but we're not going to stay on Mount Sinai. Uh, we're going to come down time. to the human beings in everyday lives. So, so there are those that explain <laughs> that this bridge, so to speak, of lo ta'aleb ma'alot al mizbechi, right? There aren't steps going up to the altar. It's a ramp. Okay? Now, figuratively, right? Symbolically, in what way is a ramp different than a than steps. It's smooth. It's gradual. Mm-hmm. Smooth. You go even. Gradual. Go even. Right. It, it, it's smooth, even, gradual. Right. Ascent. Yes, Jan. If a ramp, if, if steps are kind of digital, you know, you're there or you're not. You're there or you're not. Then a ramp is kind of analog, more continuous. Yeah, yeah. So a ramp really symbolizes what we need to have. There needs to be a very smooth connection between 
down below and up above. That's what the ramp does. A smooth connection from below to above. We have Mount Sinai, but we don't <coughs> live on Mount Sinai. We don't live in the heavens. Right? We are here on earth. But the Torah is not meant to be this guide towards living in the heavens. The Torah is meant to be this guide towards taking the heavens and bringing it down to earth, bringing it down to our nitty-gritty, to our dealings with one another, that we should have heavenly dealings with one another when we have these altercations, when we have these disputes, and when we have our normal give and take, our normal connection with other people, that there can't be this disconnect between, oh, when I am in the synagogue, when I am praying, then I am this lofty individual, but when I'm dealing with one another, I'm dealing with other people, then I can trample all over them, and right, ish et re'ehu chayim balo. Each one will swallow up the other one in how they in how they deal. So there needs to be this ramp. Now another idea of a ramp is is a very important spiritual concept that we have. When there are steps. Oh, when I'm on this step, it's level. Right? Without exerting any effort, I will remain on that level, on that step that I'm on. A ramp, I can't fully rest. Either I'm exert, I have to exert effort to stay where I am, or, or to go further, and if I don't exert any effort at all, then I will fall, roll down. And that's how we view the spiritual world that we are in, that one must always <coughs> be making, extending effort in order to be improving, in order, in order to move on. It's been likened to an escalator that's going down. Right? If you stand still, then actually you are losing ground in the process. And there's a concept that, that everything in the physical world actually represents different concepts, different realities of the spiritual world. And I always thought to myself that gravity, gravity is just that concept. Gravity is that we are always being pulled down and a person needs to, to extend that effort, expend that effort in order to, in order to, to grow in order to, to continue to develop, in order to stay spiritual, it's easy to be pulled down, and we need to make the effort. Yes, Chayivka. You know, as a senior citizen, I can't go up steps without holding onto a banister. And uh, when I was in Mexico, in Teotihuacan, that is huge Mexican temple, which I, I was a young girl then. But I found it very hard to go up way up these steps, and they didn't have banisters. <laughs> so uh, I understand what you're saying, it seems like the concept is a beautiful concept, but uh, physical limitation, I mean, I'm bringing it down to the physical, is very hard to go on a ramp, to go on steps. Uh, anyway. They're both difficult. They're both difficult yeah. if, you're, if you're not steady. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. Dove. Isn't Jacob's ladder a, kind of like a ramp? I don't know there was a ramp. I don't think it was. I think it was a ladder. It's a ladder. Was it supposed to be like down and going on an angle around? That's why I understand. 
And so I, I see that. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, a ramp, it wasn't. The angle, it's, it's hard to say, you know. You know, I, the Torah says it was a sulam, mutzav, art of rosh hashemayma. It was a ladder, right, with the feet on the ground and the head reaching towards the heavens. It doesn't give us much of a... No, they much, say the midpoint was right. Over the okay, 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 fair enough. <laughs> okay. So, the Eile, so we start now, 416. The Eile ha-mishpatim asher tasim lifnehem. Right? Rashi points out the Eile, and these are the mishpatim. Right? So the Vav, the, called the Vav HaChibur, the, the, the letter Vav, which means and, is coming to connect this to that which we had previously. Saying, Ma Rishonim Mi Sinai, Af Elu Mi Sinai. Just like the previous, the previous teachings were given on Sinai, Af Elu Mi Sinai. So too, these were also taught to Moshe on Har Sinai, on Mount Sinai. Meaning, once again, that these, these, um, earthly, seemingly mundane laws actually are Mesinai, they are from the heavens, and they contain in them a tremendous amount of this godliness. Now, the Gemara speaks about different sages, right? One of them, I, I think, is of Yochanan HaSandler, right? See, he was a sandler. He would make sandals. So the Gemara, I think the Gemara says about him that he was miyached yichudim. Literally means he would uh, renew or he would bring the oneness of God right, into all that he did. Right? So some explain it to mean, oh, while he was stitching his sandals, he was, his thoughts were engrossed in the deepest Kabbalistic uh, ideas and concepts. So he was down here stitching, but actually he was miyachi yichudim, he was making, he was, he was delving into the depths of God's oneness and God's unity. And others explain, no. With every stitch, he was establishing God's unity, God's oneness, meaning when we speak about God being one, right? That's, that's a big concept, right? Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. God is one, right? What, what, what does that mean to us that God is one? God is one as opposed to being many, a composite. Like, what, does that, what does that mean to us? How is that meaningful to you that God is one? What does that mean to you? Everything is from God. That we're from God. Everything is from we're God. from God. Everything is from God. And, and, and if you'll allow me some heresy for a moment, right? <laughs> and if God was not one, if God was a composite of sorts, would that then make it that we can't say that we're from God or everything is from God? Right? If God would be not this perfect oneness, whatever that means, but was a composite, would that mean then, oh, then not everything is from God? And would that mean I'm not from God? Right? What is this God's oneness? Right? What, is it, what does it speak of? Yeah. Maybe the origin of all Mishnahs are... Again, I'm sorry, the what? What is all souls. Okay. Okay, and again, if he were a composite, it couldn't be from that composite? I suppose, but then maybe um, when it wouldn't be as uniform a concept of um, in Hashem's image. I mean, it would be different parts of that composite. Okay, okay. 
I think um, it's hard to quantify because everything is a combination of different things like materialism and even things that we can't see. It's and Hashem is just one. It's you know there has to be one to to make and create all of these things. Okay. It's not clear. Be, it's okay. Clear. Yeah. It's yeah. Clear. yeah. It's hard yeah. to think I, of so, it. As so one explanation that I've heard <coughs> is something that I think speaks to this idea of mishpatim, right? If there, are there, if there are the different parts, so to speak, you know, composite different parts, so to speak, parts okay, of, what? of God, right? If he is like this but composite... Different gods. gods. Well, not really different gods, but even different parts of God, mm -hmm. right? So I could be, okay, well, if I'm davening well, then I could, okay, I, I could be good with, with that part of God and... You know, am I dealing with other people or is not the way it's supposed to be? Okay, so then I'm not, you know, I'm not so good with, with that part of God, right? Whereas I could also, if God is compartmented, I could also compartmentalize. And I'll be good in these respects. And when it comes to that, all right, that's, that's going to be my, my weak aspect. The idea of God being one is there is no compartmentalization, if that is a word, right? It's got to be fully integrated, right? The way that I act in shul, the way that I act in the market, the way that I act in my home, the way that I act in my business, the way it's all one. I'm sorry? Midot do not split. Midot do not split. Okay. Explain what you mean by that. Um, I know where, that one. <laughs> where a midah is expressed in one area of your life, it will also be expressed in what another, mid, whether it for good or for a bad. A midah is an attribute yeah. or a character, yeah. character trait. A character trait, yeah. Yeah. So God is one is all the areas, aspects of your life. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. And yes. So it's true. We're everything's from God, and we're from God. All that is correct, but we've got to realize that it's got to be fully integrated, and we can't compartmentalize that this is something that I do, but that no, I, and that's okay, right? Now we are all works in progress. I was, I was talking with someone, right, and this person was looking to assume a real lot all at once, and then was struggling mightily with that. And I said, I said, if you're at the top of a ladder, and you're beckoning someone, come up, climb the ladder. You don't want that person to go jump on the ladder and, and, and just wildly try to climb to the top because chances are poor that they'll actually make it to the top. And they're going to end up falling and really hurting themselves. And they'll be a lot worse off than they were before they started climbing the ladder. What you want the person to do is to slow Steady, up a rung, you good, secure, okay, next rung. Secure, steady, <coughs> right, methodically, steadily to make that climb. That's what, I so, did. That's what I did. I did it gradually. I did what I needed to do. It became part of me. I said, okay, now I have it, and then I went to the next step, and the next step, because I didn't want to do too fast, and then I, I would burn out, and I wouldn't do anything. Yeah. So I did it gradually. Yeah. And it works. Yeah. And that's how you do it. Yeah. You reach the top yeah. end. So what I'm saying that we can't, that it's got to be through and through, we can't compartmentalize. I'm not saying, right, I'm not saying all or nothing. Right? Because I never say all or nothing. Right? But I'm not saying, so you got to do, right? No. But, but one needs to look towards integrating this fully into who they are. With the all or nothing, there's a beautiful teaching that uh, on, uh, on Rosh Hashanah, we have all these different symbolic foods that we eat, the simanim, which all represent the, what should be coming uh, in the following year. Right? We want to start a certain way, 
and everything goes after the start. That's the simana miltahi, the Gemara says, right? The sign that you do in the beginning that then unfolds over the year. So we have lots of different simana, and lots of, you know, the apple and the honey is the most famous, and many, many things. One of them that we have is the pomegranate. And we say that we should be filled with mitzvot like a pomegranate, right? like the seeds of a pomegranate. So there are those that say that there are 613 <laughs> seeds in a pomegranate. Right? If you count it up, I don't know if you'll find, but I did read an interesting article a while ago that there are lots of different types of pomegranates. Right? And when you take, and each one has an average amount of seeds, you take all the different pomegranates and you take the average of all those different types, it comes out to about 613. Whatever the case is though, right? if we're looking at seeds, right? so I would imagine a tomato has many more seeds than a pomegranate has, right? A cucumber has many more seeds than a pomegranate, right? What is unique, special about the seeds of a pomegranate? So, so I heard an, 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 an interesting explanation that each one is its own completely self-contained unit, right? There's even more than an apple, which also has its seeds, but the seeds are there, part of the fruit. Here, each one is, it's complete, right? You open the pomegranate, all you have is all these separate units, right? And that's how we need to look at mitzvot. Ideally, we want to do 613 mitzvot, even though actually that's an impossibility nowadays, right? Some for men, some for women, some for kings, some for Kohen, some for Levi, some in Israel, right? Etc., etc., etc. But we want to do all the mitzvot. At the same time, we need to realize that we should be filled with mitzvot like a pomegranate. Realizing that even if I'm not doing all the mitzvot, I shouldn't say, well, then there's no value in my doing this mitzvah. Right? Each mitzvah has incredible value. And we should never say, well, if I'm not doing all, I'm not going to do any. I, I, I got together with an old friend of mine that we had taught together in Israel. So he, he, he said to me, see, I, I said to him, you know, I quote you often, I told him. He said, I quote you often. <laughs> so he said, he quotes me, that there was a guy right, who, um, who wasn't yet keeping Shabbos. Right? So, so, so I had a conversation with him. I said, why aren't you keeping Shabbos? Right? You, want to keep, you want to start keeping showers. Why, why haven't you started yet? And he said, Rabbi, I need my cigarettes. I need my cigarettes. I said, okay. Okay. So I want you to keep Shabbos 100% except for your cigarettes. Except for your cigarettes. Right? You don't need your radio you don't need your lights. You don't need these other things. So the issue is the cigarettes? Okay. So I want you to keep Shabbos as you want to keep Shabbos and the cigarettes. <coughs> Fair enough. Right? Not that that is the end point. Right? But we're, I mean, we're not saying it is okay, but as, as, a, as a step or as a ramp, whatever we'll call it, Right? Right? And that's what the person did, right? For about a month. And then he said, you know, I can do without the cigarettes for a day. I can do without the cigarettes for life, whatever. <laughs> oh, right? that's, a, that's, that's another discussion, right? But at least he realized he could do without the cigarettes, the cigarettes for a day. So when we're talking about Hashem being one and integrating and all being one, we're not saying all or nothing. We're saying that what a person needs to strive towards is that integration, that integration into oneself. And actually, as we've mentioned a number of times in, in, in different manifestations, we are physical beings in a physical world. And the way that we can infuse our physical self in this physical world with spirituality is through these mitzvot that involve the physical. Right? It's not through 
a, 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 a pushing, a spurning of our physicality, but it's through a <coughs> sanctifying of who we are. And we are a composite of a physical and spiritual being. So it's through that integration and through, uh, I mentioned over and over, marriage, right, is called kiddushin, is called sanctification. <clears throat> Hareat, we just had a wedding here Sunday night, Hareat mikudeshet li, you are sanctified to me, you are being made holy to me. Vitabadzu, with this kadat Moshe Yisrael, right? So that is this integration that we need. Now, in addition to that, along the way with that, there is much that we learn about the, 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 the world as we see it through these physical, through these physical, earthy, uh, mundane, mundane laws. Let's go to, just one second. Let's go to page 420. Okay, verse, Pasuk Yudchet. So I'll take that for us in Hebrew, and then we'll go over to the English. Yudchet Ivrit Miri Bechavod. Beautiful. Eighteen, nineteen in English, please. If men quarrel, and one strikes his fellow with a stone, or with a fist, and he does not die, it falls into bed. If he gets up and goes about outside under his own power, the one who struck is absolved. Okay, he's absolved, meaning there is no capital punishment over here because he didn't kill the person, right? He just um, wounded, injured, whatever it might be. Only? Oh, there's more. Only for his lost time shall he pay, and he shall provide for healing. Okay. So actually, when one damages or accosts someone else, there are five different payments, five different types of payments which need to be, um, which need to be ruled upon. There's the actual damage, nezek, there's the tsar, there's the pain, there's the repoy, there's healing, doctor's bills, shevet, there's workman's compensation for missed wages, and there is boshet, if there was any, if there was humiliation <coughs> involved in the process there. The Gemara, the Gemara asks a question, not about this. The Gemara asks a more general question. Does a doctor have permission? Is a doctor allowed to heal? Now, why might... What is that question predicated upon? Why would I think a doctor does not have permission to heal? Because isn't that Hashem's purview, whether they're, you know, okay? Okay, what? right? What so that it's God's purview, meaning if God, the Gemara actually, Rashi explains in the Gemara, Hashem mache, Hashem mase. If God afflicted, then let God heal. If he hit, let him heal. Right? This is the will of God. Everything is the will of God. So this is the will of God. So what are you getting in the middle? This is between this person and God. How dare you get in the middle? Right? An example, right? There's a parent, right? And there's a young child. You know, young enough to understand, though. Five-year-old, six-year-old. And the child starts to wander into the street. 
a busy street, and the parent grabs the child by the arm, pulls the child back onto the sidewalk, and says, you never, ever go into the street like that. That's dangerous. And I walk over and I say, excuse me? Why are you manhandling that child? Why are you speaking harshly to that child? What would the parent rightly say to me? None of your business. None of your business. Now, if the parent is, is abusing Chas Shalom a child, you know, granted, right, we would get involved. But as long as the parent is within the, the, the realm that we would say is, that, that range of parenting, that's the obligation of the parent. And you mind your own business. So God is the parent. He, for whatever reason that he deemed correct, he has sent this situation onto this person. Right? You and your stethoscope, stay out of there. Mind your own business. Listen to your own chest. Right? Stay out of there. Right? That was the Gemara's question. And, and we understand that approach, right? This, the Christian scientists, right? There have been many law, law, uh, lawsuits brought that they don't involve themselves in any sort of medication and healing. And you have children who have a pretty, a pretty perfunctory in, uh, infection and they don't go on to antibiotics and the children die. Right, we take it for granted. Oh, antibiotics, the, kid, the kid's fine. This stuff can kill a person if it's not treated properly. We disagree with their, with their conclusion, but we can understand their approach. Their approach is that God is running the world, God's involved in the world, God's involved individually, privately with every person. And therefore, yes, maybe it's wrong for us to get involved. If we don't have a directive otherwise, maybe we should not get involved. Maybe it's wrong. Maybe we're not allowed to get involved. But if, but if God created everything and everything is from him, then he created doctors and he made he made a person a doctor to treat. Okay. He okay. So the question some, is: He was involved is in that, antibiotics and is in that, everything. So. Right. So is that a Jewish profession? Now, who will say doctor is not a Jewish profession? <laughs> so you say now, Maybe. right? But is 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 being a doctor right? We could argue again. We're going to see a source in a moment. But we could argue and say that no, that's not that's not a Jewish profession. Right? There are lots of things that exist in the world that we don't say is God's will. We say God's will is that we abstain from that. Even lawyers. But God is the right? God of everybody. I'm sorry? But God is God of everybody. It's not yes. Right? Murder exists in the world. Do we say that God wants there to be murder? No. We'll say that God allows the possibility for that, but doesn't want us to be involved in that. Right? So where does healing line up? Where, which category, where, how does that get categorized? So the Gemara, the Gemara is going to say, we have a source that a doctor is allowed to heal. And that really, more generally, is our general approach to the world. Meaning, when a person is poor, we don't say, well, God wanted you to be poor. God doesn't want you to have the money to buy what you need, because if he wanted you to have the money to buy what, he, what you need, God controls everything, he would give you that money. And therefore, it's wrong for me to interfere. We don't say that. On the contrary, we say, that for whatever reason, God, yes, wanted this person to have to go through this situation for whatever reason. But at the same time, he wants us 
to get involved. And he wants us to look around and to remedy that situation and all situations as much as we can. Because we are not supposed to look at the world through God's eyes. He gave us human eyes. And when we see a lack, when we see suffering, when we see a problem, we're not supposed to say, well, hey, it's God's world. That's how he wants it to be. We say, yes, it's God's world. And if he put me in a situation that I can help, he put me here because he wants, he commands me to help. Interesting, we say at the end of benching, right, Pasuk, Nar hayiti gam zakanti, velo raiti tzadik ne'ezav v'zaro mevakesh lachem. Nar hayiti, I'll explain, don't worry. Nar hayiti v'gam zakanti, I was young and I've gotten old. Velo raiti, and I never saw tzadik ne'ezav, I never saw a righteous person who was deserted. Vizaro mevakesh lachem. And his children are seeking bread, are in need of bread. Now, that's what David Amel King David says. Now, I think we have seen, we have seen situations where righteous people, their children are in need of bread. So how do we understand this Pasuk? So one approach, Rabbi Sachs says, is the low ra'iti doesn't always mean I, I didn't see. Lo ra'iti, let's say, where Purim is coming up, Esther says, how can I see the, 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 the tragedy that will come to my people? Lo ra'iti means I didn't sit idly and watch, right? Now we can say I didn't see, or even English, I didn't watch. Watch as a spectator. Lo ra'iti, I never watched as a spectator. I never watched idly. When I saw, David said, King David said, I never sat idly and watched when a tzaddik was ne'ezav v'zara mevakesh lachem. Rather, I entered the fray and I did what I can do. Another approach is lo ra'iti tzadik ne'ezav v'zar mevakesh lachem. Again, literally, I didn't see a righteous person who was deserted, being deserted by God, as his children are in need of bread. What it's saying is that even when there was a tzaddik, a righteous person whose children were in need of bread, he wasn't ne'ezav. He was not deserted by God. Meaning, there was a reason, there was a purpose, there was a master plan for this person to be enduring whatever it is that they were enduring. So the person is never ne'ezav. Person is never. Yes, Chaim. I'm thinking of two things. Last week we read Yitro, where Yitro explains to Moshe how that uh, responsibility has to be broken up into smaller groups. And in, in the way Hashem seems to have set up the world, He created a system of surrogates. Parents raise their children, doctors take care of sick people, rabbis take care of the spiritual needs of people. There is a system where one helps the other. Yeah. It isn't, you just say, okay, God does it, I don't do anything. God does it, of course God helps raise the children. Yeah. Of course, of course God helps the yeah. doctor nice. heal the children. Of course the rabbi helps the spiritual growth of the people. So but so there is a system yeah. of organization and surrogates to, to promote, because it's so overwhelming. The world is so overwhelming. Yeah, I just saw, I think it was written up in our, in our weekly from Rabbi Sachs. He said something that was, that was such a beautiful thought that it, it never struck me before. How do we say life? Chayim. Right? How do we say alive? Chay. Right? But life is chayim. What is chayim? Many lives. It's life in the plural, plural, right? 
So I might be alive, I'm chai, but my life is chayim, meaning I need to be right, connecting and dealing with others. Right? Man cannot be an island. Life means co-joined uh, living, right? interacting with one another, right? helping, getting helped. Right? The, the, the morning brachot, anyone wants to join us, tonight we're having part three of, of the series on tefillah. So last time, part two, we went through, we went through the, the morning blessings and what they represent. Right? And we thank God that we can see, that we can sit up, that we can stand up, that we can walk. Right? We, don't mention, we don't say, I thank you God for giving me eyesight. Right? We don't say shanatan li, uh, uh, right? we say pokeat, we make a more general blessing. You open the eyes of the blind, right? etc., etc., etc. There's one blessing that we say, the first thing that we introduce, li, me, is the bracha, bracha ta'ashem, elokeinu melechalam, sha'asa li kol tzarchi, that you have done for me, you have given me all of my needs. That's where I mention me. Right? All of my needs are taken care of. You, you, you oh, what can I do to help? How can I help? Right? Well, if, someone comes for, if someone comes for help, you don't say, did, did, you, did, did you pray this morning? Yes. Did you say your morning blessings? Yes. Did you say God gave me all my needs? Yes. So why are you coming to me? You have all your needs. Have a good day. Right? That's not the approach we're supposed to have. Right? So in general... We view ourselves, the, the famous Pasuk, Na'ase Adam, let us make man, that we need to partner with God. And very famously, when Hashem came to Avraham by Sodom and Amorah, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Hashem says to Avraham, the cries of, so of Sodom and Amorah have come to me, right? and I will go down, I will descend, and I will see what's going on. And I will decide what to do. So Avram understood, why is God sharing this with him? Because God wants Avraham's involvement. It makes no sense. There's nothing that Avram can say or do that God is not aware of already. He's going to start to advocate. We'll find 50 righteous, 45, 40, 30, 20. Right? Right? What is he adding to the discussion that God doesn't know? Absolutely nothing. Nevertheless, God doesn't want us to view things from godly eyes. He wants us to view it from human eyes. And he wants us to get involved whether it's advocating with God, whether it's advocating through prayer, through davening for someone who is sick or someone who's going through a difficult time, or whether it is helping someone financially or helping someone in their business or helping someone emotionally or helping someone physically or helping someone in, uh, by healing them. God wants us to get involved. So how, yes? What you're saying, I just want to say something. Israel, when something in the world happens, earthquakes, Anything massive, Israel, the state of Israel, send their out there first, doctors, yeah. everything to help people. Yeah, yeah, they are. The, is, they is, are first. The they are first responders. Right. Yes, yes, a lot, a, a lot of pride in the way that Israel, well, that's, right? that's, e that's even that's nations are. that are uh, that are at war with us, mm -hmm. uh, we offer. Yeah, that is very true. Yeah. So the Gemara has had a good question. How do we know that a doctor is allowed to heal? So the Gemara says, oh, the Pesach says right here, the end of verse 19. Virapo yirape. English says, and he shall provide for healing. So, virapo yirape, if built into this system of damages when someone gets hurt, is that you must pay the doctor's bills, then clearly, then clearly, that is an accepted approach. 
The Gemara says, Mikan shenitan reshut lerofe lerapot. From here we see that permission is given to a doctor to heal. I might have thought, what was the argument? I might have argued and said, no, God hit, let God heal. From here we see a doctor has permission to heal. The Chavetz Chaim has a problem with this source. What's the problem with this source? What's the context of the healing that's being provided over here? Was it that God hit? Wasn't that God hit? I could understand, okay, listen, right? All I could see from here is if a person hits someone else, then you can go to a doctor. But when it was a disease, when God hit, when it wasn't inflicted by a human being, how do we know a doctor has permission to heal? How does the Gemara use this as a source for a doctor being able to heal, entering the fray across the board. This is not talking about a case where God hit. The question was, I would have argued and said, God hit, let God heal. And for s- somehow we see from here that no, we don't say that. So the Chavetz Chaim says that we see from here a from this very mundane, physical, grimy and gritty halacha, we see here a fundamental concept of how a Jew is supposed to view the world and that which takes place. If someone beat me up and I'm in pain and I've been damaged, and I've been humiliated, and I've missed work, and there are doctor's bills now, I need to realize that this person would not have been able to cause me this pain were it not that for some reason the heavens decided that I should have to endure this pain, this damage, this humiliation. So yes, God hit. I don't say God hit, let God heal. We should go to a doctor. What do you mean God hit? This guy hit me. No. No. Yes, but no. Now, this does not absolve that person. That person decided to use their free will to inflict damage upon me. That's between this person and God. But in terms of me and how I view it, for whatever reason, this came min ha For whatever reason, right? Perhaps I needed some yisurim. Perhaps I needed a little bit. I'll tell you a, a, a fantastic story about Rav Sharabi Zatzal and a person who came to him. And I, I might have shared it before. Right? So we find that by Yosef. Where do we see that by Yosef? When the brothers, when Yosef reveals his identity to the brothers and the brothers are speechless, what does Yosef say to them? It wasn't you that sent me down here. God sent me here in order to provide michya, in order to be here to provide sustenance for you. What do you mean it wasn't you who sent me down here? It was them. They sold him. But Yosef is letting them know, listen, if I'm down here, I was meant to be down here. You would not have succeeded in sending me down here if I wasn't supposed to be down here. Now, your intent, that's between you and God. Sort that out. But the way that I view it, God sent me down here. We have, we have a prohibition. Lotikom velotitor. 
It seems to be a superhuman obligation. Lo tikom, do not take revenge. Lo titor, do not even harbor that animosity inside of you. We want to take revenge. Someone hurts us, we want to give it back to them. Not even to harbor the ill feel in the ill the ill feeling inside of us. Yeah. Then we're not well, human if we so don't experience all those feelings. Okay, so that's why, but we're commanded. So how can a person overcome that? Well, this is part of the way to overcoming that. Wow. Right? If a person can accept that whatever was supposed to come to me came to me, for whatever reason, as we always say, we see a very small part. We're reading seven pages of this 3,000-page book. Then a person can look at that person and say, okay, that's between you and God. Now, I might need to protect myself in the future. A person should not set themselves up for abuse. Right? If a person is in, is, is in an abusive relationship, we don't say that's what God wants me to be in. We'll say whatever, whatever I've suffered is for whatever reason, but I'm not supposed to keep on enduring that suffering. Right? But it's a completely different view on this Hashem Echad, on this Mishpatim, on this living in God's world that is controlled, that is orchestrated by God. Yafi. I'm sorry to rock the boat, but um, how is this um, takes the Holocaust into into the picture? Is this, yeah. is this a master plan? A how is this coming something. into the master plan? How is this? Okay. We don't know. Um, if we know this, why we don't know that? Yeah. yeah so right. let me let, let me say two things. Okay. Always count on Yafi to rock the boat in a good way. In a good way. Don't be sorry. We thank you. Okay? We thank you. Right? How do we, how, Yafi in short is saying, if I'm correct, so everything's run by God, how do we accept the Holocaust? If there's a master plan. I was thinking about the same yeah. thing. How do we accept, how do we accept, how do we accept a Holocaust? So, two how things. How do we accept, how do we we accept any Holocaust, Sudan, Syria, and yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Murder. So, let me first say in general, and then let me, let me offer something more specifically. In general, we might know, accept, believe a certain concept, and not know individual cases how to apply it. There are situations where, where something that seems to be terrible, later on it works out and we see this was the greatest thing, right? You know, they, you know how many stories have we heard that a person, they discovered a certain lump, right? And they think it might be cancerous. And because of that, they go through a whole battery of tests. And in the end, that wasn't an issue. But it's only that battery of tests that revealed all the you know, other things that were going on in the body that had it not been discovered would have been quickly fatal. Right? We, we, we've heard many such stories. So there are times that we do understand, and there are times that we do not. There are times that we do not understand. Right? Not understanding the particular application in a particular situation doesn't mean the concept is wrong. If we, right, a person can believe in the concept without knowing how it applies. And that's the example I gave before, that our life is like 10 pages of this 3,000-page novel. We're going to read 10 pages. We're not going to understand it all. That's a given. We're not going to understand it all. How could a person wrap, wrap their heads around uh, a Holocaust? So, I'll share with you something 
that I heard from a, a Holocaust survivor. Okay? I don't, right? a, a person who hasn't experienced it, I don't think is really in a position to, to, to speak about it. Right? But let me share with you something that I heard from a Holocaust survivor. Speaking about himself, who survived, he shared with us, the audience that he was speaking to, how it gave him a completely different perspective on life and appreciation of life. There are many that that, and he went into details. There are many that that was their experience. There are many that that was not their experience. There are many that that is what completely turned them off to, to God, to, to Judaism, and to, and to God at all. We have many, many situations now of people right, growing up in Europe who are in, in their 50s, 60s, and on their parents' deathbed, they're hearing that, that they were Jewish. Right? There's, in Hungary, a fascinating article about a person who was a far-right extremist who then found out that he was Jewish. Yeah. Right? He I, was saw the, him, I saw he, him in Israel. Yeah. You know, and they found out that he was Jewish. You know, the parents didn't want the kids to know about it. They said, with, with all that we suffered from this, right? So we have certainly elu ve'elu. We certainly have have you know represent representatives of both of both groups. What this person shared, which was a, which was I thought was a fascinating insight, is that well, again we. We live in this world, to us this world is everything. And we can't imagine past that and what goes on after that. And how our life here is a small part of a long, long journey that each soul, that each soul, each neshama is, is part of. But he said, we have a teaching that if a person dies al Kidush Hashem, which means in sanctification of God's name, because of their being Jewish, then they reach the highest places of Gan Eden, of the Garden of Eden, of eternity. So, a thought that he shared with us is that for those who remained there are the scars and the, the trauma and all of that. For those who actually perished, this was a, a, this was a, a, a means of millions and millions of souls who on their course of life could have gone this way or that way to be elevated up to the highest levels. Now, we, we who are living here in this world and don't see anything past this world, so it's hard for us to, to swallow, to accept, okay, what will happen afterwards Will, will outshine and will justify. But I'm willing to accept that my, that my perspective is so limited that I can't fully appreciate how anything afterwards could justify such horrors over here. But I'm willing to accept that that's only because of my limited perspective. So, Yafi, 